Hello, everyone, and welcome this afternoon to this great session with Google and Jamf. Uh, this session is Trusted Access and Beyond. Um, just a reminder for everyone that um, in order for everyone to participate in JNUC, if you submit your questions via the Q&A app, that you've got the JNUC app, and anyone who's watching virtually can also submit their questions. We have a QA and a at the end. If you don't manage to submit them, we can ask some questions live in the audience as well. I'd like to hand over to the Jamf and Google team to take you through this session, have a wonderful time, and make sure you get those questions in for the team. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Everybody awake after lunch? Feeling good? <laughs> Ready for some more sessions this afternoon? Awesome. Well, hey, uh, nice to meet everybody today. My name is Josh Yogfeld. I'm the Senior Director of Technical Partnerships and Alliances here at Jamf. We are super, super fortunate to be joined today by a panel of experts. Whether you feel like it or not, you're definitely a panel <laughs> of experts. Um, from both Google and Jamf, you can see names on the uh, slide up above. But we're going to actually start with a fun little icebreaker question, um, and I'm going to kind of do a 180 with this question between the Google and the Jamf team. What are uh, what is your favorite Apple device, Google team? Let's start with Prashant. <laughs> All right. So I would say MacBook Pro is my uh, favorite Apple device. Uh, uh, I got onto the one with the M1 chipset very fast, and my Camtasia processing is amazing. I love it. Great. Namdi, how are you? Yeah, I would say probably my, my iPhone. As a longtime Pixel user, when I finally made the switch over, a lot of my friends cheered in the group text <laughs> message. Uh, but yeah, iPhone, MacBook Pro, both of those. And Matt, what's your favorite Google device? Yeah, well, I have a special place in my heart for the Pixel. It was one of those early devices that when we were supporting Android early on, like, I spent a lot of time with that thing. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's a good device. Good device. Awesome, there we go. All right, now that we've cleared the air, we have all that out there, <laughs> we're going to get into the, the meat and potatoes of this presentation. Uh, the first question that I want to ask uh, and get some insights on are in the very, very changing, constantly landscape of business today, especially with as fast as technology, is changing as much as security is becoming a primary thing that everybody has to be concerned about. I'm curious from each of you, what are the biggest challenges that you think are facing organizations today, specifically commercial organizations? Uh, I can start with that. So I think one of the fee, one of the things that we have seen in last couple of years is how we work has changed drastically, right? Uh, employees are working out of home. Right? There are a couple of studies around almost one third of the employees are permanently remote. Half of the employees are working in a hybrid way. And what that has led to is, uh, you know, browser being more important because even the organizations are starting to realize, you know, and uh, warming up to web apps. So from both users' perspective, as well as what their resources they are trying to access perspective, the boundary is totally disappearing. So in this new paradigm, how do you control the visibility into what your users are doing. How do you keep them safe? How do you ensure that data is not exfiltrated accidentally or maliciously? Those we hear day in, day out from a lot of customers that I talk with. Yeah, and uh, I guess going off of Prashant's point, sort of what we see is you're seeing a lot more security solutions being offered um, from different vendors, right? And so when you're a customer, you know, you're being pitched, you're learning new things on a daily basis. So you have this inevitability of analysis paralysis, right? What solutions should I use? Which ones work well together? Do I do a single vendor solution or a multi-vendor? Um, so like that's the biggest challenge that we're seeing is sort of like how do we help customers figure out the right solutions for themselves? And I think on the Chrome side, what we're trying to do is just build a platform that allows interoperability, right? So it makes it easy for you to choose whatever path you want to and deploy with Chrome with whatever solution you want to. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and again, kind of extending off of that, let's, uh, like, for me, it's compliance and passwords. <laughs> like, um, you know, we talk to most of our customers here. It is making sure just that your operating system is up to date and that you're running the latest version of Chrome. So all the defenses that you have in there are actually there and that you are running a managed device that is properly configured to be able to make take advantage of the brow managed browser uh, correctly. And then the other one is passwords. I mean, it's a lot of attacks the last couple of days, uh, weeks even, like, and uh, it all started with 
phishing and vishing and you know just a password. So having solutions that like take into account the whole life cycle of passwords as well as how that integrates into uh, access through browsers and through native apps is all a complete kind of picture that has to be solved. So across all three of you, I heard lots of things that have principles that regard to zero trust. <laughs> Something um, like that. Obviously, we've done some work with Google around zero trust through our Beyond Corp <coughs> partnership and work. Uh, Prashant, could you tell me a little bit about how zero trust and Beyond Corp work together with Jamf to address some of these things? Um, that's a great question. So I think, yes, so I started with problems. So let's start with those and then try to connect like what Beyond Corp does, right? So the first part is basically how do you enforce that only secure devices are accessing your critical systems, sensitive data, and apps. How, how do you ensure that this request is coming from a secure device? So that's how we solve that problem is through partnerships, right? And Jamf is a very important part of that. So Chrome does collect security posture and the user, where the user request is coming from. But we want to democratize that, so we want customers to leverage whatever tools you want to leverage, and Jamf integration is part of that. So when Jamf says this device is compliant, and you can set up all the policies in Jamf to say what makes a device compliant, but once Jamf says it is compliant, Beyond Cup will allow access to that application, will allow access to that data. And it is not done one time only at a login time, but it is a continuous authorization, right? So mm -hmm. what are the principles of zero trust? Principles of zero trust is basically do not allow access based on just network, right? That's how we have operated for a very long time. Understand the context of the device, do continuous authorization on that. And both of those things, get the visibility from Jamf, make sure Jamf says this device is compliant, but check that for every request that comes through and then only then let the uh, request go through. And it could be irrespective of whether the user is coming from a desktop or a mobile operator. Got it. So you mentioned that with the dynamics of changing work, people are spending a ton of time in browsers too, which seems like that's the inflection point for much of this stuff. If 90% of our work is happening inside of a browser, how then does uh, secure enterprise browsing fit into that model? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a really great question, right? So secure enterprise browsing, if I have to boil it to a couple of principles, secure enterprise browsing is all about ensuring that users who are spending the time in the browser are safe, they are protected, and also protect corporate resources um, without getting in the way of users, right? So secure, let's, let's now break all of this down one by one. So the first part is, ensure that users are protected. So the way secure enterprise browsing will do that is make sure users are not uh, unable to connect to malicious websites, as an example, or they are not tricked into going to phishing sites and uh, all those types of attacks. So that's the first part. Second part is when users are trying to download or upload content, make sure that that content is protecting the user as well as stop any exfiltration if the user is trying to do accidentally or maliciously. The third part of that is basically understand each and every request that is coming from the user and give administrators, that is you, visibility into what the users are doing real time. Gotcha. Nambi, I'm curious if you have some thoughts around that as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, for secure enterprise browsing, kind of like how we've been thinking about it, you know, with Google, uh, Chrome has always been a secure enterprise browser, right? So like if you listen or look at what Gartner says secure enterprise browsing is today, it is a browser that has integrated security features with its own management platform, right? And if you think about Chrome Browser, you know, that is what Chrome Browser has been for several years with Chrome Browser Cloud Management, you know, features that we have like Web Protect or Safe Browsing. Um, and so what we're just trying to do is sort of build or grow the secure enterprise browsing space by adding more features, adding more innovation, building more connectors for partners to integrate into to sort of make this experience uh, more secure for enterprises. Got it, appreciate that. So uh, Zero Trust has core principles that you can uh, leverage to make sure that your users and your corporate resources are secure and maintain that security. Matt, in the keynote today and mm -hmm. last year, we sort of rolled out this idea of trusted access. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what trusted access means on top of Zero Trust? Because that could be 
Maybe a little bit confusing, but it's more of a destination, right? Yeah, it's more of a destination. Destination. It's a com uh, combination of our own products uh, as well as ecosystem partners to basically solve that problem of only trusted users on, tr on secure devices are able to access corporate data. So if you really unpack that, it starts with device enrollment, device management, making sure you are aware of that device. I think on the keynote, they said you can't control what you can't see. And I mean, that's a really great way to just simplify it uh, and why we think the enrollment piece is so important. So it's kind of part of that. It's like making sure that the device out of the box has a zero touch experience to get enrolled into MDM. So you have immediate visibility of it, that you're pushing the right version of Chrome down, that you're setting up this integration seamlessly with the, the Google backend so Beyond Corp just works. So you're not waiting an hour for some magic system to kick into play for before you can start having these zero trust outcomes, they start working right away. And so, you know, for the, so that's the enrolled devices, the trusted identities, you know, that's the integrations with identity providers. You guys do that, we do Same. that. There's a combination of different layers that all kind of come together. It goes back to the password. <laughs> if you can't trust and identify who that user is using phishing resistant credentials, then you know, anyone can enroll as anybody, and, and that actually breaks down the whole thing of zero trust. So that's why I'm so passionate about the passwords part and this defense in depth and, and these layers, this layered security is important. And then the access part, you talked about Chrome, the browser is important. There's also legacy non-web applications as well that you need to have a common way of being able to um, uh, enforce policy on those applications just as much as web. And it's a little bit of a divide and conquer team sport, right? Like in the browser, you guys do an incredible job with that because you have full access to the browser and the whole you know, DOM and everything. Um, outside of the browser where there's lots of apps and applications, how do you make sure that you're managing, you give the access, just the access you need um, and also making sure that those policies are being enforced um, comprehensively. So it's really taking a look at the holistic in entire picture, all the way from enrollment and lifecycle management for the users and the device and making sure that we're sharing signal and making these outcomes come to life. So trusted access sounds like it's sort of where these security best practices meet user productivity That's right. or efficiency. Can you, if you had to just distill down and boil down into a few specific areas, where would you say that that is the most evident in a user's day-to-day -day experience. Where are the places where they're going to experience this sort of, this bounce, where if you don't do it well, you actually are gonna sacrifice a ton of user experience and, and productivity. Yeah, I mean, the login, <laughs> again, <laughs> login's a big one, and like that's super, again, identity is everywhere. You're logging into web apps constantly. You're not just in one application every day, so as you jump between web applications, how are you making sure your identity is being enforced in a way that doesn't require re-auth with your password all the time? So that's one of them. And then the other bit is, again, like making sure you're using, you're enabling the users to have the right um, network connectivity, the right browser experiences, the right accounts pre-provisioned, just getting out of the way so that you can, you, you can have this clear path to everything you need and nothing that you don't need access to that just is, is set up for you out of the box, ready to go. And if you have to jump through a lot of hoops, you have to log in a bunch, you have to use you know, specific, you know, features install extensions within a browser or something manually. If, 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 I, if I can't, IT can't do that for you, you just run into lots of friction. And that's what these guys help out with on Chrome. Gotcha. Yeah, Namdi, I would love to hear your opinion on this whole idea of user experience and security at the intersection of the browser, since yeah. that's where we spend so much time. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point about friction, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things that we launched last week actually was Device Trust Connector. Um, so that's an integration with IDPs. Um, so allowing you to take context signals from the browser from the device to decide what level of access that user should have and what kind of resources you should have. Uh, hopefully Matt will be working on that really soon, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh, and um, yeah, so you know, taking away that friction of having to maybe download another agent for the user, right? Um, you know, that's like a that's like a weak point in your security story is having the user deploy all of the security things that you need to your device. So if we can take that into the browser, incorporate all of that so it's done behind the scenes, and all of a sudden you have Jamf and Okta, you know, sort of doing that handshake within the browser without the user having to experience it. Yep. I think that really opens up, you know, sort of like a really great space for productivity and frictionless employee access. Awesome. Prashant, curious about your thoughts there. Yeah, so I was kind of thinking in my mind, right, if all of these technologies are not integrated, what are the hoops you will make the user go through? And mm -hmm. when they are tightly integrated, how transparent the experience is for the administrator and end user. We have talked about so many things 
URL filtering, passwordless access, IDP integrations, understanding the context of the device, the user who is trying to make that access, continuous authorization for every request that comes in, provide, provisioning a least privilege access, right, core mm -hmm. principle of zero trust. But if we can hide all of that complexity with the integration behind the scene and things work out of the box, that is basically the user experience that we are gunning for. And I'm proud to say that we have put a lot of foundation layers. The, the speed is gonna, the momentum is start, we will start to gain more and more. But even today, the way integrations are set up between Beyond Corp and Chrome as an example and um, Jamf, the user basically logs into their profile and from that point onwards, everything is set up. The user doesn't need to do anything. The only thing from the Chrome perspective they do is basically log into their managed profile through the IDP of their choice, mm -hmm. and all the signals are handshaked in, back, in the back end. It is aligned with the principles that you have set up, what means my device to be compliant, and then every time user makes a request, the, user is, uh, the uh, request is checked with the context where the user is coming from, with the context where which device the request is coming from, and now you are also protecting the user if they are trying to go to any malicious website, URL filtering, categorization, data loss protection, and data loss protection even is not like, oh, user is not allowed to download or upload. Of course, those kind of crude controls are still available, but it is much more context aware that the user coming from a managed device is allowed to do this, user coming from unmanaged device is mm -hmm. not allowed to do this. It could be download or it could be simply print or copy on a browser and things like that. So the, the beauty of all of these things that we are talking about having a tightly integrated solution is what, what matters to administrators and end users. What I hear is that the great opportunity here with the focus on security is to be the great unifier of all these different teams at an organization Identity mm -hmm. and access management, endpoint management, uh, security infosec, because when those tools don't work together, you create user friction. There's yeah. all these hoops that you have to jump through. So maybe this is our moment. This is what we've all been living for, the <laughs> opportunity to align teams internally. Yeah, I mean, and zero trust just doesn't work if you don't have it that way. Stuff falls apart. It's not only the user experience, but like, you know, we had to solve the device ID problem was our big problem, right? Like, you know, it's deceptively difficult to securely say, like, you know, this device that is managed by Jamf has this identifier. And by the way, hey, Google, you're not part of Jamf. Like, this device identifier, you're going to see it at some point, and we're going to signal that to you. That actually, that ID is a managed device, and you should know information about that. It's actually a very hard thing to get right. And um, if you don't have the, dis you know, that's why we're here today, right? Like, we're, like that very purposeful integration to get, achieve that outcomes there. And then you layer that on to, like, we talked about your identity integrator integration as well. Like, similar story there. How do you make sure you have a secure uh, opportunity of integrating with the identity providers? Mm -hmm. um, and, that's, I think, and then that story is only going to extend some more to more DLP products, to more native applications, to other parts of the stack. So it's going to keep on going. So yeah, in not only internal alignment uh, in creating this uh, ability for teams to be able to work together on a shared outcome to create a great user experience, but then also for both of you, I would love to hear what partnerships mean through this lens. Since you both lead partnership efforts at Google in different areas, what is the importance then of partnerships on this same sort of concept? Sure, so um, I would say for us, the partnerships is about being a team sport, right? I think that's mm -hmm. a good way to put it, right? Security is a team sport, so basically what you want to do is both both the teams are actually fighting against the adversaries. So the closer integrations you have, the e easier it is for you, as an example, I'll take off from the device context. If you understand what device it is, what kind of request it is coming from, and it is very difficult for an adversary to obfuscate or change mm -hmm. the posture of the device, and you basically have a much higher confidence between the two different companies, but utilizing the same control plane underneath, that that's one way to do it. So for to bring it back, like for Google, the the integrations or partnerships is all about how can we make where the joint solution is much more uh, powerful than the individual pieces, and uh, the posture assessment, exchanging signals, uh, the bi-directional exchange of what is happening on a user machine, whether it's a compromised or not compromised, and kind of 
making it accessible, easily accessible for administrators to not only have the visibility, but also ways to remediate down the road are the big things. Yep. Yeah, I would say, <clears throat> I guess thinking about partnerships or just thinking about Google and sort of like how we operate from a security standpoint, uh, I think we do security really well at Google, but it doesn't necessarily mean every customer is gonna wanna mimic or uh, roll out our strategy. So, you know, what we really focus on is taking what we've built internally, working with partners to understand like what they've built for their customers, and then collaborating, right? And trying to design something that actually works for our joint customers, right? And so that's why partnerships are super important for me. Uh, but to give like a really specific example, like when you think about Chrome browser, you know, we launched Chrome connectors last year. And so Chrome connectors are, you know, we'll just call them APIs, but there are integration points um, for, for security. Um, so it allows, so last year we launched our reporting connector, what allows you to get your security events into like your SIM tools or your XDR tools of your choice. As I mentioned, we launched our device trust last week and we have a few more connectors and all of those are partnership based launches, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know customers are using, you know, whatever solution uh, that they may have. So like we need to meet them where they are, right? And I think that's the general thesis of working with customers is meet them where they are and then try and, you know, take them on a journey to where they want to be. I can envision t-shirts for next year. Security is a team sport. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good tagline. Uh, that's a great transition, I think, into uh, a topic that we heard about in the keynote today, which is Chronicle, yes. something that we haven't really talked about before in the past with Champ and Google, but is now becoming pretty ev evidently a great opportunity, especially for the Apple platform. Champ has spent a lot of time in the past couple of years working with Apple and many others to elevate the amount of telemetry and insights and detections and things like that that we can gather for Apple endpoints. Tell us a little bit about what Chronicle is, why it matters uh, in partnership with Jamf and how that fits into some of the conversation we've been having. That's a great question. So uh, from Chronicle is Google's security operations platform. So uh, all the telemetry that you are basically using uh, within your environments can be sent to uh, Chronicle and then Chronicle has very powerful data uh, correlation, um, uh, uh, data anal security analysis, uh, uh, even uh, adding more context into that data, those kinds of capabilities within Chronicle exist, right? So then Chronicle is your one place where you can basically see all the activity that is going on within your environment and then correlate all of the different streams of data that is coming from your endpoint and MDMs and EDRs and all of those basically can be viewed in, in a single uh, place and correlated with one another. The things that I'm super excited about is Jamf protects uh, telemetry that is coming into Chronicle with uh, the Apple advanced uh, security events, all of those events coming into Chronicle, and now Chronicle can look at those events, do the data correlation, do the data enrichment, do the security analysis, and provide you visibility into any incident that might be happening, give you a very clear-cut guidance as to how to uh, remediate those issues, and also then set up policies in future, basically how to avoid some of those. Got it, great. I'm curious, um, as you think about the opportunity for organizations today who are maybe um, taking their first steps into thinking about zero trust, um, this is a question that I, I hear come up a lot, which is like, it sounds like a big proposition. I'm not sure where to start. What, what are your best recommendations, all three of you, for if I'm, a, you know, if I'm just growing to the point where I'm cons considering how I'm going to address security for the first time. I've hired my first InfoSec employee. I'm, you know, whatever it might be, what's the best way to get started when you're thinking about a Google and Jamf environment? Sounds good. Yeah, Do, yeah I'll take that. Um, <laughs> uh, make friends <laughs> in, the, in your organization because it is, as much as we're up here talking as vendors, like it's a team sport, it becomes a very team sport on the you know, customer side as well. Um, we mentioned zero trust doesn't work in isolation. It's, it's forcing teams to work together in ways that they never have before. I mean, we run into a lot of challenges where like the applications team just never used to talk to the network team because they just would create a network, their VPN would just allow full access to the entire network and as long as you put an application on a certain subnet, everything would just work, right? And now all of a sudden Z Zero Trust completely turns that on its head. It's bringing that policy further upstream and away from the network. So what used to just be abstracted and like it would just automatically work, 
things like that don't, uh, don't work anymore. So that applies to browsers, that applies to native apps, the whole thing. So it is, you know, my advice is to, um, you know, if you have different departments, it's to go ahead and like, you know, kind of unify on a zero trust vision and build a roadmap together. Like, I don't think, if, if one team comes at it saying like, this is my zero trust plan, is inevitably someone on the other side is talking about zero trust too, their plan's likely gonna be different. And if you are just gonna batter, uh, you know, battle the whole time, we've seen it across many customers where um, zero trust means different things to just the same people within the same organization. And until you can talk the, co you know, a common vernacular and have a common vision, <laughs> implementation is, is, you know, you're just gonna have run through all sorts of problems. So um, getting a plan drawn up, starting with the basics, like you don't need to go full blown everything to start off with, you know, getting your devices under management, again, you can't control what you can't see, so if, you know, uh, that includes BYO, like there's a big step for BYO we could talk about, but getting devices under some form of management so you have the right size management to understand what's happening, balancing privacy, all that sort of stuff. And then starting with something like a managed browser. It's a great place to start, because mm -hmm. that's easy. Like, you know, everyone's familiar with the browser. It is something that they use a lot in, in and out every day. Setting up some of these policies um, can be done through a web browser without a lot of heavy lifting. It integrates with a lot of existing tooling. It's a great place to start. And then you just get more sophisticated by adding more data to it. You bring in your other tools, like Jamf Protect or um, your other you know, endpoint security tools to just provide more context to the stuff that you were talking about before. You're enriching that context. If you start with just a very simple, is this, who is this user, what group do they belong to, and is their device managed or not? That's a heck of a great start. Like That's a really good place to begin. And then you can just layer on complexity and layer on, well, that's a probably a bad word, layer on <laughs> richness uh, from that point forward to be able to make that, that policy more, um, like more rich, more sophisticated, and ultimately, start to make your whole network and everything to do more secure. Awesome, how about you, Nandi? I mean, that was a really full and good answer. So, <laughs> no, I, I was gonna, I was also gonna make a joke that just start with browser and, and end up browser and that could be your zero trust story. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, to, to Matt's point, right, I think you know, zero trust is sort of like this nebulous phrase and it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So sort of think through, you know, what are the areas where you want to start giving you know your employees access, right? Um, for us, you know, it starts with the browser. We think the browser is your productivity tool, um, your most used productivity tool, and then start to work your way out from there mm -hmm. in terms of like giving access beyond the browser. Like, what kind of controls can I have within the browser? What kind of controls can I have within the device and the applications? And then start to figure out like how you can extend it beyond your corporate network and your managed devices to your BYOD, to your people working at home, to working at Starbucks. Um, you know, don't throw the kitchen sink at it to start, right? Very simple process of, for my most trusted user and backing my way out to, mm -hmm. you know, my employees on a work trip at Starbucks, I think is the best way to build like a zero trust strategy. Great. I would say yes, uh, the most of the points I would have said are already covered. Like the two or three things I would re-emphasize that already covered is like starting with uh, managed browser, so CBCM, Chrome, man uh, Chrome browser man cloud management. That is, that's a big start. It, because one of the things I would say is majority of the customers I have seen that they start these journeys on is with the visibility. You get the visibility first and then you do the enforcement mm -hmm. after. And you know, uh, CBCM on the Chrome side will give you the visibility. What is the activity? How many users? What they are accessing? URLs they are going to, and all of that. Right? Having that kind of visibility starts to give you a picture of these are my core sets of users. These are the buckets I can draw from. And then you go back and you say, okay, this is my first implementation. This is my first app. This is where I'm going to be starting to enforce some of the context-aware access controls. This is, these are my crown jewels with respect to the IP or data, this is what I want to protect. So figure out those use cases, get internal uh, alignment, get the vernacular right, those are the first couple of journeys, yeah, definitely, which are very important. I mean, and just to, to kind of piggyback off of that, like the visibility and the under, just app discovery is huge. I mean, you will be, that, that read-only mode to understand who's accessing what, I guarantee you, you'll be surprised. Like, how is that person accessing this? <laughs> or I thought that went away like a year ago and like we have 300 people logging in every day. Like it's, it's amazing because if you were to ask the actual like you know different teams, they would say, yeah, that's gone, throw it away. And then the next day you turn on a policy and then everyone's blocked, it's like help desk explosion and then that just causes, that gives like zero trust a bad name. And then all of a sudden like your project gets on hold. So 
can't emphasize enough that read only, like let's understand the network first, understand what's happening, and then work with those teams to enforce. Actually, I, I'll just add one example of that <coughs> where we recently saw this. One of our very large customers uh, bought Beyond Cop Enterprise and they wanted to roll it out to 100 users, test users, and accidentally they lo uh, rolled it out to 100,000 employees over the weekend. <laughs> and it's the scale of Google. 100,000 employees were all under visibility, and immediately they realized that they have a large swath of employees who are uploading documents to these websites which are not recommended. And this was, none of these was malicious, and they reached out, and turns out these were all liars trying to convert documents to PDFs and sending it upload to uploading these, and they're like, no, 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 this is big, no, no. And this is like the first five days of just rolling it out. So you, going back to you, will, you will discover what you would not have expected. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> All right, last question before we open it up for Q&A, and a reminder again, uh, you can submit Q&A questions, and we'll have uh, a facilitated discussion afterwards. This is like the first question, where it's a little bit different for the two of you from Google and a little bit different from you, Matt, but to start with the Google team, uh, Prashant, you're focused on Google Cloud security services. Nambi, you're thinking a lot about Chrome browser and identity access. Um, I would love to hear from each of you what you're most excited about for those users who are uh, predominantly focused on the Apple platform and using Google technologies. What do you think is the, the next big thing that you're excited about through that lens? All right, sounds good. So I think I, I'm super excited about the integration that we have done with uh, Jamf on the Beyond Corp Enterprise side for both our desktop Apple user as well as mobile users. Uh, the customers have complete visibility, context, understanding of where these requests are coming from. We have rolled it out to very large customers, and the experience has been super positive across all of these customers. Uh, the, the, the opportunities that I'm really looking forward to, we have integrations. I mean, of course, we are Google, so within Google, Chrome, Beyond Corp Enterprise, Chronicle are all tightly integrated. But as Jamf is integrating with these technologies, again, as, as I said, right, the, the security integrations, the power, power is always much more than sum of parts. So now having this Chronicle uh, logs from Beyond Corp, from Chrome, from Jamf, Apple Threat Detection, and all of those available, that provides an unprecedented visibility that user could not have ever had. Like if you were going to Sims and trying to look at these logs in all disparate locations, you can never tell a whole story. And incident response is all about figuring the story out, what really led us to this point. And this, these are interesting times. Awesome, yeah, too much too much stuff, right? Analysis paralysis. Nambi, how about you? Yeah, and I think for me, uh, it's like it's one word, right? It's sort of like unification, maybe it's two words, unification and simplification. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Chrome browser is, we have such a large footprint um, for, for our customer base, and you know, you have a different experience on desktop than you do on mobile when you're thinking about work, right? When you think about productivity and like the security that you have to go through. And so if we can bring sort of like this unified experience so your expectation is the same so that, you know, you aren't trying to do a workaround and a hack on your mobile phone to get to that employee resource, right? If we can make that easier for you, um, you know, that's something that we're really trying to push for over the next couple months going into next year uh, is to bring that simplification and unification experience. Well, that, that's great. All right, Matt, for you, the question is, you spend all your time thinking about Jamf security product on the Apple platform, mm -hmm. uh, but spend a bunch of time working with Google Teams as well. What are you excited about for the Apple user who's using Google services? I think it is the ability to do your work in a browser that you probably use every day, and it doesn't matter what platform you're on, and you get it out of the box, and it's just consumer simple. I mean, it's kind of simplification, unification. But it is this idea that like the tech just stays out of the way, and um, you know I wake up every day thinking about how can we get people to use it across more organizations to be able to use more Macs. We heard about user choice. There's like you know a lot of that stuff, but a lot of that actually will start to happen when you can prove usability outcomes, but also all these security outcomes by making it so it's the obvious choice. Like, wow, I'm used to like picking up my phone and going and doing using continuity to then open up the, that same thing, you know, on my other device and being able to like access my resources wherever I am and like kind of play into the promise of what the Apple platform does for you as a consumer. 
making that possible for your work is is what I think about a lot. And I think there's a lot of promise here from what we've done. Yeah, for sure. It's been it's been awesome to see the uptake of uh, these solutions as we've made the integrations and to hear about the impact and to see uh, yeah. how well it's worked. So appreciate uh, the time and attention and working with us. We are now going to open it up to Q&A, and we'll have that facilitated by our wonderful Aaron Webb over here. So I'm going to hand the mic off. Thank you very much. There was uh, not many questions coming in, and then we've got a barrage right at the end. So we had about, um, <laughs> about 50 people online as well. So I'll get through as many of these as we can. So uh, the first one that we've got here is, uh, let me just expand it a little bit. Uh, what is your posture or recommendation for shared devices that can be accessed by different employee levels, for example, associates or managers and managers? Do you guys want to take that I, one first from the browser? Yeah, uh, go ahead. I, I can take that and then would love your yeah, thoughts on yeah. that matter as well. So I think this is a very common use case for us, like especially for uh, on the retail uh, side, there are a lot of uh, devices which are common used across the board. And the beauty of here is, again, with Chrome, right? So only user needs to do is log into a managed profile and they have access to the uh, applications. There is visibility for administrator. The policies work seamlessly because we the uh, Chrome understands who the user is, what the device is, and things work. And once at the end of the day, you log out of the device and the new person comes in, logs into another profile. And the, the, from the policy flow perspective, from the posture perspective, both of those are like independent resource IDs to mm -hmm. some extent. So you mm -hmm. basically can differentiate between those multiple users logged on to that device. Method. That's exactly right. Like, so we can provide a common signal for the device, but mm -hmm. as you log into the different you know, the tabs, the Chrome tabs, as you go in and use your, your, uh, your business identity, that's a different resource ID. Yes. So that's a different, but it is it is the same common outcome and result for that same device. So if I log in and you log into the same device, the device context is gonna be the same, same, but your user context will be different. different. And so again, that's the nice layered approach of how this is all built. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so this one's about the battle of the browsers. Um, so if we have a Chrome managed browser implementation on our Mac and iPad fleet, at that point, would you remove users access to Safari? I can take that. Yeah. Um, I think you wouldn't have to, I think is the answer, because the idea of ZTNA is that you provide certified paths into your applications and resources. And the simple answer is if you are using Chrome as your vehicle into certain applications, if you try to use another browser, it's simply not going to work. It's going to look like any other attacker's browser or any unauthorized device. You don't need to force differentiation from like an application management perspective. Um, you just steer the user to do the right thing. Absolutely. I think, and this is the message pretty much all our customers love. Basically, if you are trying to access any corporate resources, come, you have to come through Chrome, you have to log into a managed profile. Outside that, you know, it, it's okay. But then the user also knows that they are protected. They, they, if they are kind of maliciously led to a C2 domain or a malicious website, they will be stopped and protected from those. Perfect, thank you. Uh, you've shown how important collaboration and, uh, and integration are for trusted access. Some uh, may have once considered it to be a Moby Dick or a white whale of sorts. So what is your next goal uh, speaking to beyond part of this conversation? Oof. So what the what is our next goal with trusted access? Basically, is that the question? Yeah, I think people have seen it as like a um, a hurdle in the past. Yeah. How would you then go beyond that and take that zero trust initiative back up again if you've already stumbled on that? Right. Uh, I mean, it goes back to having that plan. It, I mean, what has happened in the last couple of years is a very fast moving area. Like the technologies, the foundations are changing a lot, like every year. I mean, where we were a year ago is very different than we are now. Like integrations like these before, you would have to wire up through APIs or a lot of work. You'd have to just you know, get this working. And now all of a sudden, like with a simple setup, you're able to get this done. Now we're seeing that between Jamf and uh, Google. We're seeing that with identity providers. We're seeing that with other security providers. Like there's a lot happening in the industry right now with standards to be able to do more with this stuff. Um, because there's a recognition that this is happening. So um, I would, again, go back to starting with basics. <laughs> like, don't boil the ocean. Um, try to get some quick wins, get that early visibility, uh, and, and start to provide things. Like, at Jamf, we, and I think there's a session with Emily that we're doing pretty soon here, but like, at Jamf, we've 
uh, we've implemented like user enrollment in BYOD. And we just took baby, baby steps where it's like, you know what, we, we're giving you the path to how we want you to get to our resources. So Slack, for instance. Um, you know, you could use Slack, the EMM version or the non-EMM version, you could do that for a while, but then what we've ended up doing is, at a certain point we said, all right, it's time that like, we're now gonna have you go through the EMM version on this date, and like, and you know, you then if you try to log into Slack through a non-managed version of the app, you can't get in. But what we were able to do is, we, you know, when we pulled the switch, we thought it was gonna be the end of the world because like, it was like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be crazy, but because we made it so easy, and because we made it so obvious on how to like make that all work, it was actually not that big of a deal. And I think same applies for Google, you know, for browsers and everything as well. You could use that same strategy just to give that that way in. And yeah. You know, one thing I would add too is, you know, make sure you listen to your sales folks when they call. I know they're sometimes you know, very challenging, but yep. when, the part of the reason I say that is. Like you said, like the innovation is happening so quickly. Um, you know, we're adding new things to Chrome browser um, from a contact signals perspective, yep. right? So, you know, you're not only getting the device on the eye, you know, like recently we're able to give you agent IDs from like your endpoint detection platforms. So like there's a whole slew of things that you can get from browser. And this is not just Chrome, but like think about the security world in general. Like we're adding new features to make your lives a little bit easier from a zero trust perspective. So just staying on top of what's coming out from your vendors that you're using is like a really good way of you know, making sure your strategy works. Perfect, thank you. Probably the last one before we have to wrap, but really to make it rich, not complex. Is that right, Matt? That's, That's right, saying. rich, not complex. <laughs> um, so this one here, I'll break this down for you if you want any of this uh, read back to you, but you mentioned ZTNA is a nebulous terms between individuals and organizations. It is, also true is it also true between vendors? Clearly, Google and Jamf are more aligned, but what about vendors who are not playing the team sport as closely? What challenges this, does this bring, and do you see a standard for device risk signals in the future? Hmm, it's a good one. Um, yeah, the, you know, the, like I said, there are standards starting to emerge. There are shared signal frameworks, some stuff like OpenID uh, is an, as an organization has started to put some of this out there to democratize some of the signaling between entities within the, the space. So it is definitely moving ahead and, and forward. I mean, companies like ourselves who are philosophically aligned on zero trust, we recognized it early. We're like, you know what, we gotta build something in absence of an open standard, we're gonna build something that's gonna give our customers the best possible experience. And that's exactly what we did. And you know, for the zero trust to win, it does need to be adopted by many, many more people. So I think people are coming around to a standard. I think zero trust is such a buzzword and it is so open to so much interpretation. Vendors inevitably will carve their narrative to fit where they want. But that's why I think all of us are here today saying like, you know, we don't have all of it. We, you need to talk to us, we need to talk to you. We don't have the whole piece just ourselves. Um, because having everything is, is very hard and then you end up compromising on user experience and other sort of items because you try to be everything to everyone and that's very hard to do. No. I would add to one thing to like this answer is basically, I would flip this question. The power is actually with the customer's power is with you. You yep. can tell the vendor that, hey, you two have to play nicely. And you have to look at the vendors which are playing nicely and part of the broader ecosystem basically, which means that the systems are more secure. And that, that, that's how basically this can be enforced on both sides. That's a great point. Yeah, I love that response. If that's something that you're seeing and you want to uh, chat to us about, I think there's a brain date about um, which vendors you're using and come and talk to us. The Jamf Marketplace is a great place to see which vendors we work with. And if you've got ideas about who we should be working with, definitely reach out to us and start having a conversation. So I love that. I love that flipping that. Thank you. Okay, that's probably about all that we've got time for. How do we get in touch with you um, if anyone's got any questions that they've got beyond this session? Uh, how do they reach out? What's the best way to get in touch? Yeah, for me, I'm on LinkedIn. My impossible to spell name is on there. You'll find me there. Uh, also on Mac Admin Slack, so happy to answer any questions in there. Uh, yeah, same LinkedIn, impossible name as well, uh, <laughs> but easy to find. Uh, no Mac Admin Slack for me, though, but you can find me on LinkedIn. Yeah, difficult names have one advantage. There are few of those on LinkedIn, so same, <laughs> same plus one. There's also, too, uh, for any of you who are GNF customers, if you work through your customer success teams or your support teams and you do have specific inquiries about partner integrations or integrations you'd like to see, you can work that back to my team who then interfaces with these great folks on a week-in, week-out basis. So that's a great way to submit feedback, uh, bring up those conversations, and then we can tie all the pieces together. So thank you, everybody, for being here. We'll hang out around in the room for a little while, but let's hear it for our great panel presenters.
Good job. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day.